<laughs> not his fault. Not his fault. No. Well, I see the curves have joined us. Good morning, Judy, Sandy. Good morning, everyone, actually. I won't try to repeat all the names at this point, but I think it's 10 o'clock Central Time. And so I want to say hello to everybody officially and to call the forum to order now, please. I'm Connie Nestor, and I've had the distinct pleasure of chairing this Scottish American History Forum for almost 12 years I, when I looked at the calendar. And I also want to wish you all a very happy Easter weekend. This is a holiday, so thank you all for joining. I know this means so much to everybody. And I also want to say in case, and Chris, I'm not sure you know, know this, but the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arch, Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots. And of course, formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society. And I believe that's still the name on all the registered documents. And we are the oldest 501c3 charity in the whole state of Illinois and was founded way back in 1845. And uh, the gentleman on the board in those days uh, started a place called the Scottish Old People's Home for the elderly who had nowhere to go. And um, it's over the years evolved into Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, where we have a whole campus assisted living, uh, memory care, shelter care, and independent living. So it's really quite a project for us here in Illinois. And um, also Chicago Scots, if you're wondering, is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity uh, through service. And if, if you can mute your phones, please, um, when you're not talking. Uh, but we uh, support Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. Oh, so talking. for additional information, please access our website, which is www.chicagoscots.org, and please give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care charity. It's a one-of-a-kind mission that all Scots can be proud of. So I'm, uh, Jack, do we see, is Gus on yet? Can't tell. No, he Gus. isn't on yet. He isn't on yet. Okay, well, we'll, we'll catch Gus. Uh, let me know if you see him join. Uh, I know he was planning to be on this morning. Gus Noble is president here uh, of the Chicago Scots group. And he does plan to greet everyone and give us an update. But um, just another little quick reminder before we begin our presentation this morning, and that is that next month on May 13th, we're going to have a, an unusual speaker. We're planning to hear from Dr. Brendan O'Leary on May 13th. He is an historian from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and he's going to speak to us on the futures of Northern Ireland and Ireland. So I hope you'll all be here for that. I, that promises to be very interesting. And, um, oh, there's Gus. Hey, Gus. So there's our president. You're, you're looking very uh, presidential in your wardrobe this morning. <laughs> but Gus, please uh, ha take the floor. <laughs> Very sorry, Connie. Um, can you see me and hear me okay? We can. Yes, we can, Gus. You're breaking up very badly. Anything you can do, Jack, to help Gus? Oh boy. Hey Gus, we can't make out a word. <clears throat> I 
I think we may have lost Gus. He's, he's so, going to try to come back on. Excuse me? He's going he's gonna to try to come back on. Okay. Real good. Hi there. I'm really sorry. Sorry, Connie. That's uh, okay. Yeah, I hear you now. I'm, I'm running between corralling two energetic young boys and Wi-Fi. So I apologize for patchy service and, and late coming. But I hope everyone is well. I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentation this morning. Okay, well, thank you, Gus. Thank you for being with us. So, and, and Kevin, so now I believe we're ready to move forward. And we're, we're just so very pleased to have you joining us today. Uh, this is Professor Kevin James, who is the Scottish Studies Foundation Chair and a Professor of History at the University of Guelph, Ontario, Canada. And Dr. James is going to discuss Victorian travelers in Scotland. And so, Kevin, I think Jack and I are probably ready to turn the program over to you now. We'll mute everyone and dim the cameras. But afterwards, don't forget, we'll have a, a great question, answer, and discussion. And we'll be turning your cameras back on and unmuting you all. So uh, get your questions ready for Dr. James. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to make sure that you can see the screen. You can see it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, I want to begin by thanking you all for welcoming me for also and to tell you as well how impressed I am with the activities in which you're engaged. They're truly remarkable, charitable endeavors, which I can speak to the philanthropy of the Scottish community and the wider American community, which I've something for which I've always had great respect. But also like to talk to you just about three personal connections I have to Chicago and to Illinois. Uh, one is that my cousin, my, with whom I'm very close, and his family live in Glen Ellen. Uh, he's a, a cardiologist in Glen Ellen, and he has a, a family there whom I've had the pleasure of visiting. My brother is married to a remarkable um, woman from Spring Valley, which is outside Peru, Illinois. And I'm about to welcome a graduate student who's graduated from Loyola uh, in Chicago in September. So the two are family connections. The third is a very valued intellectual connection. I want to also speak to you brief, briefly about our collections themselves. We have the largest Scottish collection of material, the largest graduate student cohort, and the largest faculty complement studying Scot Scotland history and culture outside Scotland itself. We have dozens of extremely skilled graduate students we have a collection of tens of thousands of rare documents, both print and manuscript. And we have deep connections with the Scottish Canadian community, best exemplified, I think, by our longstanding partnership with the Scottish Studies Foundation. My chair bears the name of the Scottish Studies Foundation because of all the extraordinary and energetic fundraising they did, not only on behalf of this chair, but on behalf of the students whom we train at the University of Guelph. And with that in mind, I'd like to extend an invitation to all of you to join me at the University of Guelph. If you find yourself in the Toronto area, we're about uh, 60 miles northwest of Toronto, so not far at all. In fact, on the airport side of Toronto, we have collections we'd love to show off. We have students we'd like to show off and of whom we are immensely proud. And I enjoy always engaging with the community. It's the community who make our program so very vibrant. I thank the foundation in particular. I thank the Scottish Canadian community in Canada and more widely, including our great friends and neighbors and cousins in the United States. Thank you all. Today I'm going to talk to you about Victorian travelers in Scotland. Now, a convergence of political and economic and cultural factors helped to shape interest in Scotland, especially as a site of travel amongst Britons. This interest was nourished in the Victorian period by artistic and literary development, some of which preceded the ascension of Queen Victoria to the throne, by improved infrastructural development, 
and by landscape interventions and framings of the landscape, which were profoundly influential over ideas of Scotland in the popular imagination, which filtered through, of course, to the tourist imagination. But I want to qualify my comments uh, first. Interest in Scotland historically and in the Victorian period did not just focus on the Highlands. The central belt of Scotland and the lowlands too, and I have a remarkable student doing wonderful work on lowland tourism, borders tourism in particular, was seen as epitomizing many of the industrial advancements, places like Glasgow, seen elsewhere in Britain, or agricultural and even industrial improvements in parts of the borders. And sites like Glasgow were places of pilgrimage for the industrial tourists. So it wasn't just about going into nature and seeing the beauties of the mountains, the rivulets, the streams. It was also about seeing industrial progress, observing it, marveling at it in the great urban centers of Scotland. Just as the borders, as I mentioned before, was becoming a place freighted with rich literary association. So we can't speak of Scottish tourism, though I will be doing much of that today uh, by focusing only on the Highlands. We have to think of the broader compass of travel, which uh, people engaged in. Of course, if they were going to the highlands, they were passing through the borders and the central belt. And amongst a select group of tourists, the practices of what I call uh, the grand home tour, and I'll explain what I mean later by that, endured well into the later 19th century. Unpacking the incentives for the Scottish tour requires close readings of individual texts and explorations of the variety of incentives that they reveal. And we're fortunate at the University of Guelph amongst our manuscript materials to have a collection of travel accounts from the Victorian period, handwritten or manuscript travel accounts. And of course, these are one of a kind. They've never been published or printed in any way. They and other resources help us to gain insight into the motivations, into the structures of tours and other aspects of Scottish travel. And I want to talk to you now about the context of the home tour before I move on. By the middle of the 18th century, a tour of the continent, the so-called Grand Tour, was very firmly established as a rite of elite masculine passage. Its cadence and its canonical sites, places like Florence and Vesuvius, but also important urban centers in Northern Europe, and increasingly in the mid and late 18th century, parts of Switzerland too, became important parts of the itinerary of the tour. Towards the end of the 18th century though, there was a renewed orientation in Britain towards domestic tourism, the home tour. And yet it replicated many of the codes and conventions of the European grand tour, appreciation of art, architecture, demonstrations of refinement of taste, and of course, critically, the forging of social connections. A man might meet, or increasingly a woman too, might meet her spouse or his spouse in the course of the grand tour. And hopefully for some on the home tour too. So here we're talking about a set of very clear conventions or institutionalized practices where particular places and particular routes to and through those places were formalized. And an infrastructure, not just of transport, not just of roads and eventually rail, but roads we're talking about now, and books, but also aesthetic codes permeated down to the social classes. It began with the elite, and by the late 18th century, it was a vocabulary, a vocabulary that was shared with the upper middle classes too. It became a way in which people were credentialed through participation in a particular style and route of travel and also through writing about it by, and employing certain conventions when they wrote. So there was a symbiotic, what I call textual and territorial relationship through which people claimed expertise and knowledge and allied themselves with other people who were considered educated, erudite, and elite. Now until the first half of the 18th century, British travels, travelers tended to prioritize European landscapes and especially those that evidence sign of human intervention, signaling humans control over nature, so agricultural spaces, pastoral scenes. However, this began to change as more wild uh, scenes became more prized, mountains, gorges, waterfalls, 
uh, gaps, giant gaps, forests, all of which tended to draw people to places that were once le of less interest to them and often framed as peripheral regions. And that wasn't just true of Great Britain or of Europe, it was true of North America too. Romanticism, an intellectual mo movement that glorified these unspoiled landscapes and especially the individual's emotional and mental engagement with them guided by aesthetic codes I'll be discussing soon was another important factor. And this reorientation embraced traces of humanity, ruins, castles, abbeys, and the historical associations that these, they conjured, the idea that these man-made places were now being reclaimed by nature. I'm gonna talk a bit about the rise of the home tour now and uh, what gave rise to it. A number of factors influenced changes of taste. One was political developments and the emergence of a particular style and form of patriotism. Of course, famously the union of England and Wales on one hand and Scotland on the other in 1707 and the creation of this modern political entity, Great Britain, and then the addition of Ireland in 1801 and the creation of the United Kingdom was part of this process of uh, expansion, political expansion, territorial expansion. But it was accompanied, of course, by the expansion of empire in the Seven Years' War. And also critically, not just you know, ever forward extension of the compass of the British Empire, but as our American friends know well, a fun fundamental reevaluation of the precepts and character of nationhood that happened with the American Revolution. So it wasn't just a, a story of progress and wider still and wider, because the bounds of the British Empire were narrowed with the American Revolution. And the French and Napoleonic Wars, of course, played a part too, both in practically orienting people towards the home tour when it became practically impossible to cross the borders uh, to Europe. And it gave it a new ideological impetus too, as a ritual of affirmation of national identity in the context of war. The rise of natural history was another factor. It promoted this interest in the classification, categorization, and analysis of natural phenomena in the 18th century, and an appreciation of a diversity in nature. Travelers saw themselves as information gatherers. They were informed by texts, which they brought with them. And here where the performative aspect of the tour was critical. It was a discursive demonstration, a demonstration of the command of particular style and type of knowledge, the knowledge of nature that was a fairly limited and elite knowledge and the manner in which they were just the topographies through which travelers passed were described. The influence of art and literature over aesthetic tastes for landscapes also influenced travel practices. And the relationship between art and travel and aesthetic codes reached its uh, absolute zenith with Reverend William Gilpin and his so-called search for the picturesque, during which he attempted in the later decades of the 18th century to define a picturesque scene in very specific ways. Now, we tend today to employ the term picturesque as the term has evolved and it isn't a bad thing, it's characteristic of all language. Um, that it evolves. But to, we use it rather more generally and loosely than Gilpin ever envisaged. We describe something picturesque if it pleases us or um, it, it seems pretty. In the same way we refer to the sublime in a more generalized sense. If we have a dessert we like, perhaps we'll be tucking into Easter dinner uh, tomorrow and enjoying something that will characterize us as a sublime dessert. We have trifle in the fridge and I can tell you I find trifle absolutely sublime. But there were very specific uh, definitions of these particular codes that emerged in the 18th century. A picturesque scene of the kind that I have here on the screen evinced the quality of a picture. There were three basic categories, if you want to describe them that way. The picturesque, the sublime, and the beautiful. Beautiful was about smoothness and form. Sublime, as we'll see, was about vastness and scale and size. But the picturesque implied a certain lack of order. It had irregular elements in its arrangements. It had variety, it had crookedness, 
shades and surfaces. You can see this here in the image I'm showing you. It's, you know, the, the stream is not a straight stream. The image itself is being almost framed by trees. There's shading in the sky. And this is kind of characteristic of the picturesque scene. It also implied arrangement and intervention by a viewer to the extent that other views, or other codes like the sublime did not. So very often people were instructed where to stand in order to fully appreciate a picturesque scene. There was a particular place from which you could gain a view of a vista and fully appreciate its picturesque characteristics. Now the sublime, by contrast, made most famous by the theorist, theorist Edmund Burke, that famous opponent of the French Revolution too, looked at chasms, mountains, and other features and explored emotional and mental responses to these landscapes centered on terms such as awfulness, and terror. And we think again of the evolution of the meaning of awful. We don't like something today, we may describe it as awful, but awful in his understanding was something that inspired awe. And I think that this is something to keep in mind. Something that was terrible was something that could conjure terror in the in the immediate response of the viewer. So there's a combined and interlaced emotional and mental engagement with something that was uh, that, that was grand, that almost diminished the individual because of its vastness. So we think of mountains in particular as affecting this response. Literature also played, oh, and I have some images here I should add. From, I, I have a collection, uh, Chris Robinson who's joined us know that I, knows that I have a particular affection for uh, travel, literature of all kinds, including sketchbooks that I uh, collect, uh, just not, nothing fancy or expensive, but ex and we use them to teach with at the University of Guelph. And here's an example, I think, of a, of a, of a image that could be in some respect sublime and in other respects picturesque. Here's another one from one of the sketchbooks that I own, um, which is an example of, um, I think, a picturesque scene, a meandering, river or stream, again, the effect of the of the trees, which are essentially framing the picture too. And here's, I think, a much more clearly sublime image. You could imagine an individual apprehending these mountains and it's diminishing his or her importance, not only in the natural world, but in the eyes of, the, of God who had created these extraordinary topographies. Literature also played a key role in shaping taste, poetry, novels, and other forms of writing. In the 18th century, national interest in medieval Gothic and in Celtic themes developed, part, departing from historical interest in classical models. It also turned attention, of course, to Great Britain itself, led by Sir Walter Scott in the Borders and Highlands, and William Wordsworth in the English Lakes and spurred by those ideas of romanticism, which I discussed before, which glorified nature and the individual. Now, this combined with antiquarianism, amateur collection and study of relics and artifacts of Britain's past, which had a particular inspiration um, in the Celtic world. Uh, the Ossian poems discovered, and I used inverted quotation marks there, by, uh, or uh, inverted commas, by James McPherson in 1760, helped to popularize Celtic mythologies and reorient interest away from the continent to the unique dimensions and cultures and topographies of the home, uh, the home or the home tour. The Napoleonic world of wars then hastened and hardened this process of turning people towards the domestic sphere, but it didn't initiate it because we see so many things that were occurring in the 18th century. What we do witness in the late 18th and early 19th century is a consolidation and coda codification of the home tour in a, into a canonical set of sites and practices. And of course, technology and transport technology in particular played its role in improving access to isolated areas. Technology in fact played a role in a number of ways. Printing technologies made road maps, county maps, descriptions and guidebooks much more available and at a much cheaper price. Guidebooks and travel narratives, and we often distinguish the two, 
by the explicit presence of the author in the travel narrative. And in the case of a guidebook, an explicit prescriptive narrative or vocabulary, the idea of this is what you ought to see. And the, of the, the absence of an explicit author within the guidebook. So there's almost a first person who's always present in the travel narrative, who is almost always invisible, inconspicuous in the guidebook. But these two forms help to textualize the landscape and democratize taste through tutor, tutoring tourists in the aesthetic codes, which we discussed earlier, which once had been very much the uh, knowledge base of elite tourism. So socio, though mostly after taste had em em embraced the wild tourist infrastructures, um, that are the, the wild tourist infrastructures made access easier, ultimately with railways, of course, but before then roads to such places as, as the highlands by the mid 18th century through the efforts of General George Wade in the 1720s and 30s and his successful and fellow Irishman, Major, Gen Major William Caulfield up to the 1740s. Though by the middle of the century, the Turnpike Trust system, a system of toll roads, had expanded considerably. I think the United States often that you know the Turnpike is still a term in common use there. We don't use it here in Canada as often, but we sure have them. I can assure you of that. Um, so these are part of the infrastructural, if you will, the kind of economic and uh, and wider changes that enabled the penetration of the North. And here's an example of the ways in which these uh, infrastructures allowed travel north. Social and economic changes were also leading to higher rates of urbanization, especially throughout uh, Northern Europe. And industrialization in places like Scotland and in Britain more widely reshaped the idea of the urban center as a place of leisure and civilization. Now, essentially, it was a place of toil. And this led to a strong sentimentalization of rural areas and spurred the interest in rural travel. And, I, and so did agricultural improvement. And as I say before, when I was discussing industrial tourism, which we'll speak to in, in a few minutes as well, there was intense interest in agricultural improvement and in touring and traveling to apprehend what was going on in the name of progress especially in Scotland in the post-Union years. Now, all of these influences, as I mentioned, were initially associated with the elite and educated. They did spread down the social scale, aided by the expansion of literacy and the influence of the guidebook. Now, certain val uh, districts of Great Britain are strongly associated with tourism in the late 18th and early 19th century, the Wye Valley, North Wales, the Derbyshire Peaks, the Lake District, and of course, Scotland, the subject of today's talk. In Scotland and the borders, Lanark with its falls and picturesque sites and other places were popular, but the heart of interest started to become the Highlands. And I want to ask why that was. The development of a new national narrative surely played its role. Even Scottish intellectuals, or many of them, after 1707, saw the Highlands as a periphery in Britain. And yet they also came not only to appreciate it, but to embrace it as a central part of the narrative of Scottish distinctiveness and a unique and living remnant of a distinctive and undiluted Celtic culture. And of course, this was uh, I, I, I spurred on also by that interest in Celtic uh, history and culture that I discussed earlier. British peripheries, and I use that term, you know, uh, not, not as if I believe them to be peripheries, but uh, as they were perceived before this development, places such as Wales, parts of Ireland and, and parts of Scotland, were regarded then as living museums of pre-modern civilization and an interrelated Celtic heritage. There's also a project then of rearticulating the nation by Scots. So too much scholarship on travel to Scotland focuses on travels to Scotland by English tourists. Scots participated in this process. 
they were building a national narrative. They were building two national narratives in effect. One, the narrative of Great Britain, of which many were loyal and energetic participants, and another of Scotland that was compatible with this British project. And the nation's history and scenery were bound with acts of travel and nourished by popular taste. So with romanticism, Ossian, James McPherson, the people I've spoken about earlier and their extraordinary influence over the, over the uh, romantic uh, era in Scotland are critical to this process. There are multiple and interlapping incentives. The home tour of a home nation could be a ritual affirmation of Scottish identity or British identity, or in effect, it could be a ritual affirmation of both. Early tourists, as I mentioned earlier, in Scotland, as in Europe, favored fertile areas. And so this often led them not far beyond Edinburgh and Glasgow. In fact, they, they, they would often head north to Edinburgh and Glasgow through the borders and then south again. The Esk Valley south of Edinburgh was within walking distance and boasted great variety, including a chapel and castle at Roslyn. The falls of Clyde near Lanark, southeast of Glasgow, were also part of the tourist circuit by the 1790s. And the first paddle steamer, the Comet, appeared not long after then. But the borders, especially the Tweed Valley, became sites of potent symbolic interest that boasted both variety and romantic historical associations brought together by Walter Scott's historical fiction, The Lay of the Last Minstrel, ruined abbeys such as Melrose, which epitomized the picturesque and that idea that particular creations by man were somehow being reclaimed by a more powerful nature. So borders tourism matters. Lowland tourism matters. We do not know enough about it. And I direct any energetic student of mine working on an MA or a PhD to contemplate that as a subject of study. Scott, of course, we know was an Edinburgh born, Scottish raised intellectual, lawyer raised in the borders, educated at Edinburgh University, a celebrity, and in fact, a tourist site in his own right, as we shall see. And certainly the 19th century's most famous uh, Scottish author poetry and historical fiction. He paid, played an absolutely critical role in popularizing the Highlands, as had earlier people like uh, Thomas Pennant, of course, Johnson, uh, Johnson and Boswell, and Sarah Murray too. And, but Scott's Lady of the Lake, based on Loch Catrin and the Trossachs, was another example of how he uh, excited popular interest in Scottish landscapes. He also built a magnificent country house, Abbotsford, in the, in the borders in a traditional Scottish baronial style, which in his own lifetime became a site of tourist pilgrimage. Meanwhile, the Central Belt, as I've mentioned before, was also a site of intense interest as a place of industrial tourism. The Carron Ironworks near Falkirk, the great cotton mills near Glasgow, and the ships that sailed the Clyde and made it such a hive of commerce, um, also attracted touristic interest. But the Highlands occupied a special place that was not replicable on an English group. And I think that's important. You could observe industry, hives of industry in other urban places. The Highlands, it was believed, possessed a, an especially unique scenery, an especially unique language, people, culture, and a vast landscape that eventually became perceived as barren, but that was not always the case in the 18th and 19th centuries. One important point to make is that only a very small number of people, perhaps a few hundred, visited annually in the last quarter of the 18th century, made it as far as the highlands, favoring lowland area areas. But its reputation became more and more established thanks to these writers in the later 18th century and early 19th century. And one of these writers is the person about whom I propose to speak now, and that is Emily Provenon. As a way of illustrating some of the ideas I've discussed, I would like to present the story of Emily Trevenon. 
He was born in 1786, died 1856, so a comparatively long life. She was born into a wealthy family, not a gentry family, but one which had um, impeccable connections. She was a confidant of the Coleridge family, whose accounts and her accounts of travel reside at the Ransom Center at the University of Texas in Austin, where I was privileged enough to hold a fellowship some years back and just chanced upon a treasure trove of Scottish related material. So as in Guelph, where who would expect the largest collections of Scottish material outside the UK would be in a semi-rural area of southwestern Ontario. So the Ransom Center at the University of Texas Austin has some really, really, really extraordinary items. Now in 1817, she and two cousins embarked on a tour of England and Scotland, which encompassed Derbyshire, the lakes, but especially Scotland. And this is what she produced as uh, after she returned. She traveled by coach, changing horses at inns. And the travels are detailed in this travel journal here, written, as you can see, in a very elegant hand. Scotland occupied a great deal of her interest in time. By her estimate, 462 of 1,139 miles logged were spent in Scotland, and 205 pages of the 340 page travel journal that she produced, in which I show you on this slide, detail her experiences in Scotland. So in effect, there's kind of a disproportionate focus on Scotland in the travel journal, which is somewhat unusual because she professes at the start to not know if she will even make it to Scotland. It is not at the outset of her travels a known final destination. And yet when she arrives there, she spends much more time there. She spends many more pages describing it. And I think in the entire compass of the tour, it reads very much in the end as a tour with the destination of Scotland firmly in mind. The Scottish leg of her tour took her from Carlisle to Moffat through Ayr, then northwest to Glasgow, followed by a steamer across the Clyde, which was not uncommon at all at that time, to Dumbarton, and then to Gaelic-speaking areas of Argyllshire, before turning south through the Trossachs and Perthshire, and then through Stirling, Linlithgow, towards Edinburgh, Melrose, and then leaving Scotland to Northumbria, or, or Northumberland. And I will show you in a few minutes the map of that tour. And I want to discuss briefly how this her tour here represented on the map reflects some of the bigger themes that I've discovered in my general exploration of the compass and cadence and canonical sites associated with the Scottish tour in this particular time period, and particularly with this kind of figure, a well-educated, erudite, and uh, well-connected person. It was very much in the style of what I call the grand tour. Notably, her tour and her account of the tour was signposted by gentry houses, such as Inverary Castle, where she enjoyed the hospitality of the landed elite through letters of introduction. And traveling this way, she was very much expressing her participation in a culture of privileged travel and replicating the practices and conventions of travel that were associated with the Grand Tour. Letters of introduction were prepared in advance of travel. Sometimes they were posted ahead of one's arrival and they more or less compelled a prospective host to welcome uh, a common friend uh, guest into his or her home. So if I presented Connie with a letter of introduction written by Gus, and uh, it was in a sense, a, a it vouched for my um, credential and also requested that I be received uh, by Connie as a guest for a period of time. In this respect, a lot of elite travelers avoided inns and uh, hotels, although there weren't a large number of large uh, hotels at this time, altogether in their travels by staying with members of 
uh, usually elite circles with whom they may not have had direct personal contact, but with whom they had a friend in common. And this is the way that Emily Trevenin aimed to travel. When she did end up in inns, she was none too pleased, I can tell you that. And she's described the Scottish inns in decidedly unflattering ways. The tourist route also embraced the lakes and parts as she described in her title of the Northern Kingdom, which signals the extent to which Scotland was enfolded within a wider tour that encompassed key landscapes of the United Kingdom. Even crossing the border, frankly, was narrated in very subdued ways. It wasn't clear as she crossed the border to Scotland and from Scotland that it represented a, a, a momentous uh, transition to her at all. Internal transport within Scotland, when she made it to Argyllshire, for instance, was narrated as kind of a transition point, entering a point of, uh, of real cultural distinction. But when she traversed the border, uh, it, was, it was rather uh, commonplace for her. She also met with many distinguished travels, some by design when she presented letters of introduction to them in, in order to secure either a meal or a place to stay. Or by happenstance, she encountered the Guinnesses of brewing fame twice by happenstance in her travels. But it also indicated that she was, you know, in a fairly narrow compass of uh, activity, traveling in places where she was encountering by chance some other extremely elite people. The sheer extent to, the, to which the Gentry House serves as a marker of her tour reflected a variety of incentives. I mean, this is funny to me because when I initially read through the diary, she just struck me as an inveterate snob. There was no uh, orientation that I recognized with my modern mind, my 21st century readers had on, because she was signposting all sites and places in relation to castles, to recently built country homes, and to the seats of the nobility or aristocracy. Why did she employ that so promiscuously in her travelogue? Well, I think it reflected an overlaying what I call, and I don't want to you know, send everyone uh, to sleep with this, a socio-topographical knowledge. My parents have both said, lose that term, I would uh, find some another word, which demonstrated the extent to which the country house, such as the home of the Duke of Argyle, remained a feature of the tour and credentialed her as elite. So just by knowing as she passed the carriage by in your carriage who lived in that particular place or being able to recount it in her text was a way through which the author, as an author, she credentialed herself and also made it made it known to the readers, and this would have been circulated amongst her family and friends, that she was a person of erudition, esteem, and a part of the circle of elite travelers. And so what I've come to call this practice is that associated with the grand home tourist. I kind of want to almost copyright that term because I use the term to denote both the grand home as an object of interest, these stately homes as an object of interest, and a set of destinations, and even as orienting places in her travel home, but also, uh, as a more conventional designation for the grand tour. So I've created this kind of, it's not a portmanteau, but it's something like that, the grand home tour. So she's engaged in a home tour, which is largely informed by grand homes. It also had an important urban element, shepherded by one of the most eminent Glasgow industrialists of the day, William Harley. She and her cousins embraced Glasgow as a site of marvel, modernity, and mechanical wonder, and a place of tremendous commercial prosperity. They paid visit to the utopian New Lanark community run by Robert Owen, though he wasn't there uh, when they arrived. And they observed this again in Edinburgh. So the tour defies the title and the stereotype of rural recreational travel. It was also about marveling at modern industry and finding it in the Northern Kingdom. At the same time, her engagement with rural spaces revealed a firm grasp of the aesthetic codes of the era, which we discussed earlier, the picturesque particularly and the sublime. The travelers gazed on Coraline through the window of a summer house, she wrote, as if 
in a picture. That's almost the, the definition, the textbook definition, certain Gilpin's definition of the picturesque. At an inn on Loch Urnhead, the traveling party procured the services of a, what they called a nice little girl who led them to a waterfall on foot. There they enjoyed, and these are the words of Trevenin herself, provender and vistas, including young women in the river washing clothes with their feet. And again, Trevenin with her skillful eye towards the composition of a scene in the style of the picturesque following the codes and conventions of Gilpin and others, that they described, they, they resembled figures in Italian scenery. She also praised rural landscapes and not just people with reference to aesthetic codes, especially the sublime. Indeed, at several points during her account of her Scottish tour, she explicitly used the term sublime, such as when her touring party took a boat tour of Loch Lomond. And from there, she remarked on the majestic ranges that she said formed the entry to the highlands. At Glencoe, Trevenin wrote that she had never seen scenery so awesome or sublime. Two words that we spoke of just a few minutes ago. And I should add that she also had with her the impedimenta of a genteel traveler, a sketchbook. So she brought the same kind of book with her that I've showed you images from, uh, from other people in my collections and in the University of Guelph's collection. And if the crossing into the south of Scotland occasioned little notice, as I've mentioned before, there was intense interest as she crossed into Argyllshire. And this interest in the Gaelic speakers of that county, especially the women attired for church service. And here we see evidence of the inhabitants of the Celtic periphery, as she appraised it, evoking both curiosity and admiration, especially of their piety. She was herself the daughter of a clergyman, Trevenin, as were the cousins with whom she traveled. And she saw the strict observance of the Sabbath amongst the Gallic speakers of Argyllshire. She saw the pains to which they went to ensure they, that they uh, attended Sabbath service. She saw the simplicity in which they lived as signs of their devotion and piety, which were at once foreign to her but which also deeply impressed her. When the party arrived at Tarbet, they embarked upon a boat trip to Rob Roy's cave, accompanied by a repast of Highland mutton, eggs, bread, and butter. For those of you who observe Good Friday um, traditions, I think you may be getting as hungry as I am listening to that. Trevenin described the striking countenance of one of the two boatmen, a fine figure of a Highlander in figure manner and intelligence. McAlpine McGregor, the guide, claimed direct descent from Rob Roy and propounded on the story of his ancestor, she said, with spirit and animation and entertained the travelers with his knowledge and with what Trevenin approvingly described as his taste of scenery. This tour came at a time when there was building excitement nourished by rumors that the life of Rob Roy was soon to be issued anonymously in print. Transcribing an inscription about Rob Roy, Trevenin remarked on evidence of the mounting interest even by the peasantry, she said, regarding this impending publication. And in the context of this intensifying interest in Rob Roy and a prevailing view that Walter Scott had at least some hand anonymously in its forthcoming publication, an encounter with his descendant added a special allure to the travels. So these encounters validated more exotic elements of the tour, though its compass in terms of how far it penetrated the Highlands might strike us as relatively modest when we think of a modern Highland tour. You can hop on a bus and on Edinburgh's High Street and, and embrace a far uh, greater geography these days in a single day or two than she did in a much much, much longer travels. And that brings me to the final point on the tour, the climax of the tour, at which Trevenin had often evoked Scott's writings. So she cited them freely and often in the course of her writings. She ended her tour in the company of the Wizard of the North. Just showing you some additional pictures here. 
of her of places she visited. And finally, where she ended it all, visiting the Wizard of the North. Preventing's enumeration of gentlemen's seats, which I said was so critical to the composition of her narrative, reached a crescendo with the declaration that Scotland's most famous grand home, perhaps, although recently constructed, had been reached. Abbotsford, she said, is now the attraction here. And famous hospitality shown by Walter Scott to all, even those without letters of introduction. And of course, the women were not disappointed. The day after their arrival at Melrose, they were welcomed at Abbotsford, Scott's baronial pile, breakfasted with Scott, who regretted that his beds were full and could not accommodate them, but did invite them to dinner, an invitation which they declined, preferring they said not to linger, although Trevenin did spend time with Scott on a personal excursion led by him to his childhood home before departing for England. And this pointed to another feature of the grand tour and its narratives sociability not only with gentry but with literati. Others who followed would replicate these practices and later with Burns's mausoleum and others, places associated with these great literary figures would become sites of pilgrimage and tourist interest, private and public sites with differential access depending on the social capital of the tourist. If I was a wealthy figure with connections, I might be able to access, access Scott's home as it remained in the family. Now, Emily Trevenin's tour took place in 1817. And then the decades that followed, the economic, social, and cultural landscape of the Highlands changed irrevocably, with considerable implications for tourism. A reminder of the tour that she took, which again, made it through the Highlands, the, certainly the areas of the Highlands which others followed and preceded her, but not into the Northeast and not really into the Central Highlands even. A reminder that this tour was a Scottish leg of a wider tour, knitted into a landscape in which many of the same discourses and practices were evident when visiting, for instance, the lakes. A reminder that the industrial and urban elements of the tour were of critical importance, almost as much so as rural spaces, and that rural spaces also included the borders. And all of these tourist sites and visiting all of these tourist places allowed the travelers to display and accrue what we call social capital or you know, value through demonstrating knowledge of systems of productions, of, uh, of aesthetic codes. I'll tell you one thing. Emily Trevenin's grasp of systems of complex things like glass manufacture are exceptional when you read her pages and pages of description of them. And I would argue that the reason that she devotes pages and pages to describing them is, it, is, is not dissimilar to her identification of uh, gentry seats in the course of her text. They are a way in which she both accrues and deploys knowledge as a way of elevating her social and cultural capital. Now, one thing that does really change remarkably, you know, it's happening in 1817, but it really accelerates beyond, is the trope of empty land in the Highlands and how the Highlands are appraised. The idea of it being empty is sometimes identified as a feature of Highland travel. It is not in evidence here and it might be a function of the compass of her Highland travels, or it might be a function of the periodization of Highland clearances and depopulation. Partly, I think it was the scope of the relatively narrow um, compass of her Highland travels, which were largely contained to Argyleshire. But this was soon to emerge, this trope, this idea, this really important discourse around the empty Highlands um, with as tourism became increasingly commercialized, as the development of an infrastructure of travel uh, intensified, particularly railways, and as depopulation in the Highlands accelerated. And what were to become elements of Highland travel practices and observations 
that were to become more prominent in the years after Emily Tremendon left. One was this idea of emptiness linked to depopulation and clearance out migration to places like Canada, places like the United States. The decline in the population of parts of the highlands helped to reframe it from a place teeming with people, which is frankly how it often seemed in her accounts, to a place emptying or emptied of people. And increasingly, the land became used for other purposes tied to travel and tourism. Commercialized sport began to replace sheep. Grouse shooting, of course, was one such activity. It was a group activity. It brought high incomes to estates during the season from the 12th of August to the 28th of December, seen as healthy and masculine and uh, 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 revenue generating. And deer stalking was another activity. By 1839, there were 28 deer forests in the highlands, although they're generally generated less income than from grouse. Of course, also rambling and fishing. Golf had a wider constituency than elsewhere, and of course was present in the lowlands too, and became ever more established and expanded through the second half in particular of the 18th, I'm sorry, of the 19th century. At the same time, there are things to keep in mind that make island travel distinctive. One was its seasonality, and it is even so the case today. Many hotels shut from October to March. And by the late 19th century, the expansion of railways made excursionism popular. And by excursionism, we mean day trips. The ability to reach a point and to turn around in the space of a day. And we distinguish excursioning from other forms of travel, which involve an overnight stay. In the highlands and lowlands, hydropathy, that's resorts which use water for curative purposes, as opposed to spas. So these are places like where the hydros, the great hydros, like those in Strath Pepper uh, on Bridge of Allen developed. And meanwhile, of course, the imprimatur of fashion was conferred by the royal family at Balmoral from the late 1840s on. So what I'm enumerating there are a series of changes that are observable in practices and framings of the Highland tour, especially after the Trevenin tour of 1817. All of these places and practices contributed to building a strong sense of what ought to be seen and ought to be done in the Scottish Highlands. As many people who occupied places well below Emily Trevenin's station without her resources or connections, including many Scots themselves, took it upon themselves to tour the Northern Kingdom in the Victorian period. The Scottish tour that they performed had coordinates in practices and in languages of travel that complicate our search for a single set of incentives or spaces that lie behind the Scottish tour. Thank you. Well, bravo, bravo. Sorry, I couldn't get my uh, mic back on, but what a fascinating discussion, Dr. James. And um sharing Emily's grand home tour account with us. So I'd like to open the floor for comments and questions for Dr. James now, please. Don't be shy. And please feel free to call me Kevin as well. Uh, um, but... Thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, I have a question. I have a selfish question. Um, and it has to do with the university um, as opposed to your presentation, but you were talking about the fact that you have the largest collection of material and dozens of rare documents and primary source materials. I'm just wondering, do you happen to have a large collection on the American Revolution or not, not, I would say not, not as many, no. We have, we, we have we, our oldest documents, like, I think date to the 14th century, we have a very, very large and valuable uh, land charter collection. 
we have a very extension, uh, extensive collection of chat books, hundreds of chat books. On Monday of just this past Monday, we launched a an, an physical and online exhibit of our Jacobite collections, which are amongst the largest in the world outside Scotland. And oh, uh, oh. They're, extraordinary. they're extraordinary. So we have, if anyone finds themselves here within the next 12 months, there's an on, there's a physical exhibit in our library space, but there's also an online exhibit, mm -hmm. which I think will be permanent. And um, yeah, those are some of the, and, and we're building a, tra a travel collection. That's not to say there aren't absolute hidden gems everywhere. It's, it's why I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm I, an ambassador. I like to think of myself partly as an ambassador for the program, but the best ambassador for the program are our students because they are so strong and so um, successful. And um, you know, that they can, that they can study Scotland in Canada. I don't encourage, I encourage them as part of their degrees to always go to go to Scotland, I can tell you that much. And they don't require too much encouragement, um, but they, 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 they can be supervised and, and have that level of support in Canada is something we're very proud of. So I do encourage you, I mean, who knows what, what nuggets you might be able to find. Wouldn't be, the, to my knowledge, the strongest collection we have. Well, Guelph is a wonderful place. I had the pleasure of visiting the university and the town and uh, the Scottish North American Leadership Conference was held up there a few years ago and it's just a wonderful place. So I would also uh, encourage all of you to go. It's, it's fabulous. Questions, I think Dawn and, and Sharon. Or is that a question? It's my, my question. Yes. Uh, Donald Gillis in Toronto. Thank you, thank you for a remarkable treatment of this area, Kevin. I, I would be happy to endorse what you say about uh, going to your department and library in Guelph. I've, I've been able to go there several times, I'm happy to say. With regard to the travelers going into the highlands and bearing in mind what was happening to, shall I say, the common people of the highlands after the pathetic failure of the Jacobite revolution and then later on to the overwhelming uh, cruelty of the Island clearances. To what extent do you know if these elite travelers met any of the, the common people as part of their tour? That's a great question. I mean, certainly when they were in the highlands and, and certain Gallic speaking, speaking parts of the highlands, they were very keen to have some sort of intercultural encounter. I would say there was kind of a performative aspect to the uh, uh, to the encounter. I wouldn't wouldn't describe them as related, at least in the travel accounts, as very deep and penetrating conversations or uh, appraisals that uh, that tended to go. They they didn't tend to go far beyond the kind of caricatures or stereotypes. Uh, uh, but the stereotypes themselves were not negative stereotypes. There was a sense of you know the benightedness of the peasantry. Very often, the, um, the 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 poor conditions under which they were living. Uh, the there was often a critique of of the landlord, even in travel. Right, I wouldn't say that necessarily in these elite travelers, but in in the later, you know, from the mid nineteenth century on, even guidebooks would talk about you know the Highland clearances as part of that introductory section, which would provide us. Many guidebooks do today context for understanding the nature of the Scottish of Scottish travel, but I wouldn't say in my own encounters that uh, with texts, except those of which are explicitly polemical texts, you know, written in order to persuade um, people of the you know the privations of the Highlands, which is an important subset of travel texts that did exist in Scotland as as they did in Ireland. Many of these manuscript travel accounts are more about kind of containing in requiring but also containing appraisals of the Scottish peasantry in a sense um, exoticizing them um, but also presenting them as 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 um, 
in in favor in a favorable light, in a more favorable light, and not really exploring or excavating the origins of their poverty or or the clearances. Thank you. Very good question. Was it Sharon? And I know Allison has a question too. Yeah. Hi. I, wow. <laughs> I was scribbling in my notebook as you are as you are doing your lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I actually am coming at this from, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and I do storytelling and narrativity. And I was just struck by the parallels of storying as exoticism and then storying of my ancestors, which was leaving. <laughs> so yeah. we have these parallel narratives and it really does kind of build off what Don was asking is, um, you know, the experiences of Scottishness and how like the tourism is circular almost, but then my people, the Craig Miles, actually we were members, early members of the St. Andrew Society here in Chicago. Um, and uh, it's just a very interesting difference between them. And I'm in the process right now of rescuing an archive. And so I'm very excited to hear about your work with archives um, here in the Chicago area um, from early Scottish um, kind of founders in Chicago. Um, I have artifacts from the 1830s and they're letters of introduction. Oh, wow. And what's, it's, I, I wish I could, I can send you images if you're interested. But what's really interesting is how you were talking about these letters of introduction and just last week, I was going through this, I'm rescuing this archive from a basement of a church that's closing in Chicago. Um, and they've been there 180 years, Lyonsville, and I'm rescuing all these artifacts. And we were founded by Scots folks. So I'm mostly from Aberdeenshire and like these little towns outside of Aberdeen. So I have letters of introduction from um, famous um, reverends in, Aberdeen, you know, the first church, uh, was the North Church in Aberdeen. And I'm just finding these out. And the letters of introduction for the women are hilarious. So my question to you is, are some of the letters that you've discussed, are they the kinds that are sort of like, oh, please accept this person. She's of, like you said, good character, of high moral standing. <laughs> and were those different than any letters of introduction for, for the, the men who are going on grand tours. Are you seeing any gender differences in your, your research? Well, one thing that I would say I don't encounter, I, 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 I can't say I've looked carefully at it. It's an excellent question, the gender dimension. One thing I do <laughs> is letters of introduction, I think they might be different depending on the purpose and the institution that to which they're, or the person to whom they're presented, because these don't vouch for people's morality or upstanding character, because that is assumed, right? Like uh, uh, the, the elite traveler doesn't need to have someone, uh, as maybe a, a church might, um, have, have another minister attest to their character. This is just, um, the, the, the implicit um, messaging is, this is a common friend, uh, or not a common friend, or you know, this is a friend I have, and you know, you please treat them with, with please extend hospitality to them. So I think that was somewhat different. I think that their character, their resources, their morality um, were all implied, and their status were all implied in the mere issuing of a letter of introduction for the purposes of travel. Um, but I do think it's quite interesting what you what you remark upon. I mean, what I found interesting in reading Trevenin's account is how she often demurs from any offer of a stay. Like she presents in a letter of introduction, will stay for dinner, but then will claim that she, you know, it should not stay the night for whatever purpose that she doesn't suggest it's sort of a immoral or unethical or something that's kind of transgressive behavior because it clearly isn't but these are three women traveling on their own they take great pride they declare at the end of their journey three women travel the you know, the length and breadth of great britain independently they say that explicitly and with with some pride at the end of her travels but it also does shape her travels a lot it shapes her travels. It shapes her appraisal of, of women. It shapes, she, she is in uh, the frequent um, company of a male who will escort her 
from site to site to site. So she has a male who escorts her, uh, the son of this uh, William Harley, who, who, uh, who when he, William Harley is not available, takes her from site to site to site in Scotland, or to Ed in Glasgow. She is someone who performs a similar function in Edinburgh. So she, it, she, it's not as a, even Rob Roy guiding her, or Rob Roy's aunt, uh, McAl McAlpine McGregor, uh, guiding her around. This idea that she is, in some, to some extent, being shepherded. And that is consistent with some sort of gender regimes at the time, but also she's exercising independence, you know, as an as with with her two female cousins. Um, so I do think uh, you're onto something very important in terms of her her self representation in these journal diaries as both a woman who um, doesn't violate gender norms in terms of her, you know, gentility. And I think that's an important concept, but also does thing, things that quite frankly surprise me, like engages in excruciating detail with uh, manufacture, with the processes of uh, manufacture, textile manufacture and glass manufacture, which to me is an assertion of education that is often not really, you know, uh, something you'd expect of a any traveler in a manufactory. So what she does in several cases is visit a manufactory and then describe her visit briefly, but not consumption. She might buy ribbon here and, and glass there. She really uses the spaces of her journal to recount the, um, the processes of manufacture, which I find is an, it adds to that sense of erudition and education that she mm -hmm. used to have. And, on, on, and just one last point I'd make in relation to Sharon's point, which is a good one, is that, well, you know, the journal has a very different purpose than the diary that she has a separate diary, which is also at the Ransom Center. And it's an anticipatory diary, which speaks of her parents' death. And it's written in, in, in you know, in all, in a very indecipherable hand without any of the, you know, the elegance of this particular journal, which is clearly composed, I think, uh, post facto. Um, and in it, it, she kind of emotes far more about her fears of travel, about um, she going into the countryside and bewailing the, the loss of her, her parents. And then she returns to that journal several years later, um, so she, that private diary rather, and talks about, how, uh, about her continuing grief and the way in which the tour to Scotland helped to release her from a sense of uh, anxiety that attended her independence in the world on the death of her parents. So this tour was prompted, and I should have explained that, by the death of her father, which which in her framing robbed her of her like her, her second parent and launched her into independence at a very young age. Thanks for great questions. This got me thinking. With these questions are great because they get me thinking. <laughs> Kevin, um, this is Bill McLeod. Um, Today, a lot of the tourists are based around uh, genealogy, tourism, and uh, Scottish, I mean, uh, um, Scotch tasting tours. When did, when did those start coming into light? Certainly not during the Victorian period. No. I mean, this was, a, it's an, another excellent question because one of my uh, fourth year seminar students attempted a paper on the development of whiskey, the whiskey trail, uh, and, and initially then abandoned it because the source set was only in Scotland itself. I think it's very much associated with uh, with trade bodies and the Scottish Tourism Board in 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 the in the past 30, 30 years, thirty to forty years. Um, there's the appraisals of Scottish food in Trevenin's accounts are decidedly negative. She has a very she has a very um, negative appraisal of Scottish bread and Scottish uh, you know beds. So her appraisal of Scottish hospitality is really demeaning and deprecating. And I think this is a trope too. As she crosses the border in Northumberland, she says, "Ah, to be once again in an inn in an English inn rather than a Scottish inn." And of course, I've, I've written about this separately and some time ago about characterizations of the Irish in, right? Because they tended to conflate ideas of the na national characteristics with the hospitality that was on offer at these stereotypical institutions. So they condensed it into the hospitality of the inn. And she found it wanting uh, in, in almost every case, in every dimension of, it, uh, of inn hospitality. 
<laughs> it was in hospitality, in hospitable in hospitality. Um, and uh, yeah, but as far as food and, and uh, drink, I think it's a very much a post-war and I think post-1960s phenomenon. And genealogy, genealogical tourism, I think is the same. I mean, that's really been, that there's been good scholarship on genealogy, genealogical tourism, and it's really um, taken off or, you know, the, uh, that's not to suggest for, for a moment that there wasn't an extensive, extensive exchange of people across the ocean in the 19th century. The number of people who returned, and Bruce Elliott in Canada wrote about this before, you know, he's retired now, but um, he, and he, himself a very talented genealogist and scholar, um, as well, professor of history, he wrote about this, we assume that people left and never returned. Among certain national groups, that was the case. Among Scots and Britons in general, there was an intensive movement back and forth often. And there was a lot of return, like permanent return migration in the 19th century, as there was in the in the 20th century too. People who came to North America or elsewhere and didn't like it. So that's just another dimension of kind of genealogical tourism that turns it on turns it on its head and says the permanent return to family. Kevin John Armstrong, uh, first, let, I would like to commend you for a. Uh, cohesive and coherent presentation. It was um, well done, and, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, my comment, uh, much like Donald's uh, uh, references the fraught political history between uh, England and Scotland, uh, the, the Israelis today have copied, taken a page out of English history with their settlements on the West Bank. Uh, and in Ireland, uh, the, the, the plantation uh, society in Ireland uh, worked uh, along with the clearances to uh, to tamp down and pacify and to, to tamp down Irish patriotism. Um, on uh, Emily Trevenin's trip to uh, Scotland, um, did was there a plantation society in Scotland similar to uh, particularly Northern Ireland, where the English uh, planted themselves in Scotland? And did she, in fact, uh, during her tour, spend much of her time uh, visiting with the transplanted English? I mean, there I mean, there would be two, I would have kind of two broad answers to that. One is that there was kind of no uh, one Scottish um, cultural grouping. You know, this is something that I think, uh, Travelers often remarked on in Scotland, right? As they as they traversed the border, and before they traversed the border, there was an intermingling of cultures in the north of England, such that the you know, Presbyterian churches were disproportionately present in, in the north of north of England uh, compared to other parts of England. So that what was often the case, and again, I had a student uh, who was just finishing his MA on this. He's writing about Tibby Shields uh, in in the borders. Was that people often narrated familiarity? when they entered. And it wasn't because uh, there was a, a colony of people there, it was because there had been a long-standing uh, cultural, economic, and social exchange um, between people in the in, in the lowlands and in the borders, and especially, and, and in, in England, especially in the north of England. And beyond that, you ended, you, you would encounter, one would encounter, um, you know, English-speaking communities, of course, you know, predominantly English-speaking communities, vastly predominantly English-speaking uh, through much of Scotland until um, people would encounter, <laughs> pardon me, Gaelic-speaking communities, and there'd be Gaelic Catholic communities in some parts of the uh, Western Highlands and Isles, and Gaelic um, Protestant communities too. So I guess one general comment is there was no homogeneity of culture, um, economy, and society in, in, the, in Scotland. What I would say is there was a kind of um, a homogeneity of of, gen, uh, of elite classes in Britain by the 19th century, right? In the same way, the Queen Mother claimed to be Scottish and was indeed by in many ways Scottish, you know, from a claim that descended from a very noble home, but who was born in London, right? Whose family was very much oriented towards London. There, the many members of the Scottish elite by the 19th century identified very strongly with, with Westminster, with London, with the London season, with the British imperial project, with wider British commercial interests and imperial interests, so that their country homes were important kind of outposts and signals of their affiliation and identification with Scotland. 
but that can't efface the fact that in you know in terms of their 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 their, their social world was very much you know London based for many of them, uh, and that partly reflected of course the absence of, of 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 the Scottish Parliament by this point and the gradual movement of these uh, gentry figures, aristocrats, and others to wider circles. And it's why she, in effect, had access to all of these people through letters of introduction, because they had become a part of this um, British uh, elite circle. Excuse me, Kevin. Um, just getting back to John's question, I don't believe there were any plantations, British plantations or settlements in Scotland. What um, my personal perspective is, is that the British built forts and they built punitive uh, facilities and in order to pacify and control and subdue and I guess the rebel. The, the point is it's British too. I mean, that's what our students have discovered in looking at these Jacobite pamphlets that we hold. They have 400 Jacobite pamphlets and manuscript material as well. Um, and you know that it's it, by British we mean both Scottish and English. Uh, the Jacobite um, English the Jacobite endeavor, the Jacobite project, was one that had substantial support. The pro-Jacobite project in England, of course, in Ireland, and in Scotland. But so did the anti-Jacobite project. So uh, it was not a national um, movement in Scotland. Jacobitism. It was the, it was a far more complex sort of um, endeavor. Um, which is why you ended up have, seeing, you know, clans turned against clans, the Hanoverians enlisting, you know, the Highlanders against Jacobite Highlanders and others. But yes, it's a, it's on the ground, it's exceptionally complex, and Jacobitism reveals that complexity. And by the 19th century, you do see this kind of, this widening of the circle of the Scottish elite, so that they're very active participants in, in, um, in empire in London life, you know, and that's why you end also end up with aristocrats, gentry, and the upper middle class making their way north during the during the summer months to participate in 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 uh, you know the the part of sports that credentialed them, grouse, grouse shooting, deer stalking, and others. Yeah, and I believe um, I believe John that the the English or the British wanted to tame and anglicize the Irish, which is one of their principal motivators for creating this six to eight county plantation. It was absolutely huge in Northern Ireland that still exists. Um, and they wanted to transfer Scots there. So I think something like 60,000 Scots were either enticed or coerced or encouraged in some way to go to Ulster and another, within another additional 20,000 uh, British, which were soldiers and merchants preserving the peace and uh, offering the commerce by and large, is my understanding. A, the, you know, the, the exchange between um, England and Wales and Scotland and, uh, on, and, and Ireland is, is, is earlier than that, earlier than the 17th century. There were you know, uh, Catholic settlements, you know, Catholic uh, migrants, there was the, you know, there was substantial settlement in and around Dublin. Uh, there were, you know, Elizabethan settlements before that predated the, 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 um, the, the Stuart settlements. And even under the Stuarts, there were a variety of structures of settlements, which will, why you end up with different kinds of, you actually end up with, you know, farm, farming settlements, independent land holding. Um, uh, and then you end up with, um, well, Derry, for instance, the County London Derry settled in an exceptionally different way than County Down and uh, County Antrim. And the distinction between them is reflected in the uh, different um, structures of land holding, different socioeconomic profiles, uh, different cultural and religious profiles of even the Protestant communities that inhabit different parts of Ireland, North and South today. So, um, so it's a, it's a, it's an exceptionally complex and layered process of, you know, if you want to if you want to depoliticize the whole thing, you'd say like human exchange, <laughs> but if you want to maintain some level of of um, uh, so, uh, critique in it, you would say of, of colonization, of colonization that followed pattern different patterns of um, over many centuries, to be honest. 
May I say something? Are you able to hear yes. me? Are you able yes, to hear again? Yeah, I'm in Edinburgh in Scotland. Oh. I was born in Glasgow. I'm a friend of Simon Miles, who runs the Edinburgh University Graduate Association e Edelk, sure, uh, I know Simon. in Toronto. Yeah. And Simon Miles and I were classmates when we did our undergraduate geography degrees. Um, so that's how I'm sort of connected. Um, but I just I just wanted I know we're talking about the Highlands and it includes, of course, the Clearances and all the rest of it. Just to give you one or two little insights from a native on the ground. I, I did a study in the Arasig area of the Highlands, which is sort of opposite sky, kind of really opposite sky, um, on the northwest side, where a, a man who lived on a very small crop, six acres, took me, well, first of all, took me down to the edge of his crop, which is not big. I mean, it's just like one modest field, the whole thing. And he took a spade and he dug down for six inches six inches whatever that you know a wee, i like six inches um and drew back the soil and he said what do you see and it was all seashell just hundreds and hundreds of bits of shell and whatnot and he said that seashell was the beach here at the time of the clearances and that is what the people were put to live on they were put off the land so yes these awful things you talked about the the aristocracy and what are coming and wanting to have their hunting and shooting and all the rest of it, it did result in people being cleared off the land. But when somebody asks, did we meet the local people? Well, the people who had been cleared were there. They were in Canada or Australia or wherever. Um, um, but it was a, it's still, it was then in Victorian times, it still is a very real agonizing feeling about how these things have happened. And the, the farmer said to me, the crofter said to me, it's taken 150 years, whatever it was, to build up six inches of soil. And all they had were potatoes and seaweed and a bit of beach. And then you know, that's how they had to, to get to, the, you know, to survive. Now, the question was, about, did they meet the local people? And in Scotland, we were, nobody was ever, ever called peasant. You know, I sort of got the feeling that we're being described as if we're England, but a little bit, just a little bit, but we're not, it, we didn't have peasantry as such, you know, we had clans there, we had local people, and also you haven't mentioned that there were, most of the local people that they did meet would speak Scot, the third language, the third main language, which is Scots, which is a recognised language, it's a parallel language to England, English, but it has completely different vocabulary, for instance, if I put something under my arm, in England I say I put it under my arm, in Scots I'd say I put it under my oxter, an oxter is the word for your arm or your armpit. And that, that's why there's a whole language there. And that's what the local people would have spoken. And yes, they would have met local people because they would have been working in the big houses um, just as employees. And we didn't have this sort of manorial and territorial kind of people. You know, everybody was just sort of equal, even though respect, of course, would be given to chiefs and people like that. But we don't have that kind of hierarchical structure in the way that happened in England with manners and and you know middle classes and what have you. It, it was much more. And the other thing was that Scotland, pre-Victorian, uh, but still during Victorian, was a very international country with strong links to the continent across the North Sea, from Aberdeen, for example, uh, where there was great connections. And to this day, for example, there's a stained glass window in the church in Stirling where the artist who is recent, fairly recently died, he's a friend of mine, he's got the little coggies, which were little, tiny little boats. I mean, it's almost like a walnut boat you used to sail in your bath when you were little. <laughs> they came right across the North Sea. So, you know, it's not it's not quite so polarised as you're describing. You are, but of course, you did, Kevin, quite rightly say it's very complex. And, um, you know, people, people lived in a clan area or they lived in a parish and of course, the religious, religious influence is very strong. I think but your point about that. All this marvelous camaraderie of people that we're all, we all know everybody. We all know somebody from here. There. It's only a little country, you know. And, um, so I think the, I think the lo the visitors would have got a glimpse of that, you know, whether in inns or big houses or whatever. I think your point about the encounter with people in in, in the big houses is absolutely right. Right, this is this would be a site when they, where they'd encounter local local yes. people in the form of labor. So yeah, that's 
that's very true. And the point you make is, you know, a very important point about Scotland's wider history, which is that it is not just a place of, you know, mobility in the 18th and 19th and frankly 20th century when, you know, the experience of, in, in places like Canada and, you know, is a, a very heavy out migration and then immigration to Canada, but in the early modern period of exceptional mobility around Europe and even within Scotland itself, ex extraordinary internal mobility, partly yeah. A consequence of the structure of agricultural labor. So this is Tom Devine's great argument that the that the very unique um, characteristic of Scotland's mobility over the course of many centuries is tied partly to its high levels of internal mobility that then you know are extrapolated out into what much wider patterns of external external mobility first in Europe and then um, in to North America and then the wider imperial world. So yeah, I agree. I agree with you entirely that um, those are all really valuable points. Yes, we, I mean, we had our Roman roads, we had our drove roads, but I, I travel, I wouldn't say it was actually easy, the, the mobility, it was quite difficult, very difficult, but you could get around because we had river valleys and things to, that crossed, you know, to carry us in certain directions. But um, yes, there was, there was lots of interaction between, and, and people knew, it still happens to this day, you meet somebody on a, traffic duty in London and he comes from the village where you grew up you know which is absolutely wonderful in that regard um, and I think there would have been an attraction in Scotland more so in England just because it was just so different oh and I, I did meant, meant I meant to say about the food yeah okay it would be nothing like the wonderful food in England but then Scotland was a much poorer country in terms of we, we didn't have a great acres of flat land you know we had flat land left by the ice ages with all the boulder clay and all that kind of thing very very fertile and some areas of the east coast you know were very good for farming and some in the lowland parts the glad clyde valley fourth valley east east Lillian. but um the food was very basic with oatmeal and herring in those days uh, and when i was a student with simon miles we still had meal monday which allowed for the students to walk home to the highlands this was in 1960 about 1960 you could walk home for the weekend collect a sack of meal and walk all the way back and that had happened in, in living memory of my student days so people were not doing it by then you know anyway thank you for listening very much thanks for your insights and for you've drawn from personal experience and it's always nice to see a friend of Simon's here. He does amazing work for the uh, Edinburgh University. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. We were next to each other in the alphabet in my maiden name. So sometimes we were thrown together to do, you know, field work or whatever. Hi. Still in uh, touch a long time ago. Now. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. This is Bonnie Reese. And uh, that, at that last um, comments by um, Alison Robinson, I found very interesting. Um, anyway, I identify myself as an artist, a self-taught, and um, I was late to ent enter the, um, the audio on this um, lesson. Um, so I wanted to see more of that art um, display. Um, how can I, and we're contemplating a trip to Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, and we'd like to, you know, take a side trip. I think this would be worth seeing. It, where do we go to, where can I go to see this collection of art? Yeah, it's a, not an art collection per se, but it's a collection of uh, Scottish materials that includes includes visual culture and, and print material and manuscript material. And it's at the University of Guelph. So the University of Guelph is in Guelph, Ontario. Um, and it's it's about 60 miles or 100 kilometers northwest of Toronto. And we have a archival and special collections unit and the, uh, that houses this particular collection is the Scottish Studies Collection. And you can book an appointment and, and uh, view the materials, and uh, you can, you know, contact the the archival staff to to talk about your interests ahead of a visit to, because they can maybe help you identify relevant materials. Okay. Do you think the Isle of Skye is included in this? Any um, art of the Isle of Skye? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it has. It would have a rich collection of material, printed material on like the Isle of Skye. I know I was talking to a fellow from Glasgow three days ago, just he would immigrated to Canada and he was looking to compile something for his family, his grandchildren in particular, on you know the the parish he was from. And mm -hmm. 
So I just was on, on a call with him. We just pulled up, you know, material, printed material about the parish. And he just, he couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. You know, the number of uh, books and pamphlets and articles, because we actually have a collections mandate. Don't forget, we're a public university in, in Canada. So we're, we're not like, we don't have a, much of an endowment. We don't have many resources, but we've, able, we've been able to collect um, uh, because we've been declared a, a collection of national importance material related to Scotland that is you know that is exportable uh, from Scotland which can be granted an export license for, for some of the most unusual materials including lots of local histories that would really are uh, would be hard to find anywhere outside the National Library of Scotland hmm. okay. what do you say we take one more question for Kevin yeah Who's got it? No more questions, no more comments? Very good afternoon, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. We're so glad to have you all the way from Edinburgh, thank you. You know, I, I would like to share one little tidbit with you and I think I have a, a segue because Kevin was talking about modern industry and the tourism to see the modern industry, particularly in Glasgow. But um, some of us were in Washington, D.C. this week for uh, annual Tartan Day. And Chris Thompson, who is the counselor for the Scottish Government USA in the Washington office, shared some statistics in terms of what's going on in Scotland now. And I don't know whether you are all on top of this, and I'm the only one who didn't know about it, but Scotland now has constructed four spaceship launch pads and is moving into the outer space industry and technology very rapidly. And I understand commercial business uh, may be clients, but I wanted to share that with you because I find it terribly exciting and apparently uh, Scotland has cornered a niche market there and has a great deal of expertise, scientific expertise in terms of outer space and, and so on. So mm -hmm. I, I was happy to know about that. Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting today. Kevin, we just can't thank you enough. I hope you'll agree to do another one of these talks in 2024. I'll certainly be in touch with you. It's been delightful. And I just wanna thank everybody for your interest in Scotland and keeping the Scottish culture alive in North America and globally for that matter. There's a big impetus on the global diaspora more and more. And I think, you know, I'd like to see people from many countries joining in. So we'll try to take it to the next level. And Jack Sanders, thank you for all of your support. And Gus, thank you for being here. And I hope we'll see you all next, next month. And please bring your friends and family. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the invitation and happy Easter, everyone. Thank you. Happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye -bye.